Dr. Elliot Peters, a surgeon who has his palms read, initiates a journey he should never have begun, one that threatens to put an end to his sane life. Is it possession? Paranoia? The fate that lies in this surgeon's hands has him questioning his Hippocratic Oath. Maybe he's being controlled somehow, or something darker, madness even. His wife, Marion, thinks so, and rightfully. The prophecy asks of him not what he wants, but what he must do. Dr. Peters, Dr. Elliot Peters, has gone mad. Death by a surgeon's hands. Welcome listeners to your old time radio episode for a Monday no less, just to kick your week off. I have for you a creaking door episode titled Death by Your Hands. And as always, remastered and tweaked just for your lovely ears. So turn the lights off, the sound up, and get ready for something different. The manufacturers of State Express 3-5 Filter King cigarettes take pleasure in presenting The Creaking Door. It is... Oh! Oh! No! No! What 
is it? Tell me. I, I see something terrible. What are you saying? Tell me what is written in my head. I, I must know. Oh, go, I tell you. You know too well what I see in your hand. Go and never come here again. There's death in your hands. <laughs> John, Carl Cherney and all his friends. Yes, yes, I knew, madam. Please, just for a few minutes, let's go over to the water there, near the wharf. John, you haven't been listening to me. Is something wrong? Was everything all right? I can't understand what she meant. What did she see? Who? The gypsy woman. See Virgil. In my hands, she saw something horrible written in my palm. She spoke of my childhood, about, about meeting you, my love of surgery. Everything she saw was the truth. And then suddenly she, she screamed. She refused to go on, talk to death. Oh, John, don't think about it. No one was half crazed with fear for her grandchild. John, listen to me. Let's go to the party. Carl Journey's there. I know he can help. He's just back after years of study abroad, working in the occult sciences. Black magic, palm tree. Perhaps he can... Look at the water, Marion. How tranquil and, and yet how black it is. Down there. Lean out here. You will see. There. There. John, are you listening? See those lights flashing on and off down there in the water? Luminous. Each with its shining battery. I don't see anything, John. It must be your imagination. <laughs> What are you doing? You are going to push me in, into the water. Just look in your eyes. You might try to push me in to drown me. You will, won't you? I don't know. I don't understand what's happened. I, oh. I felt an irresistible urge suddenly. And then you scream. I, I realized how nearly I pushed you over the edge. Oh, so you had no control over yourself. As if you were an automaton. A tool in someone's hands. Someone's hands. Perhaps my own, Marion. Perhaps. That's what, what the gypsy saw, what she wouldn't tell me. Yes, that must be it. Oh, Marion, please try to understand. I, I don't know what happened just now. I, I can't even try to explain it. You said before that Carl Cherney was at the party. He's returned here after years of study abroad. Perhaps he could tell me. Perhaps he might know the answer. Tell you what, John? You said he was a student of palmistry. Perhaps then he can tell me what is written in my hand. I see the brilliant hands of a great surgeon. I see skill, certainly. A quick, decisive mind. And I see... What else do you see? I see also... Something tragic. Tell me what it is, Jenny. I see also death in your hands. Death. That's what it is. Death at my hands. That's what she saw too, the gypsy. That's why she feared for her grandson's life. It's there, written in feist, burnt into my hands. Death. And I see it at the water's edge. I nearly pushed Marion in. She said it. I was an automaton, a, a tool in someone's vast scheme greater than all of us, driving me, forcing me to fulfill the prophecy written here in these hands. Death! <laughs> Thank you, John. I'm glad we left the party early. 
Here, sit down in this chair. Oh. You're tired. I'll get something for you from my cabinet. You sure you can find it in the dark? No, there's no need to put on the lights. I'll find them. Did you speak to Carl tonight, John? Yes, I spoke to him. What did he say? Uh, nothing, Marion. Nothing at all. He was very charming tonight, wasn't he? He was reading everyone's cards. He's really very brilliant, John. Yes, I know. Do you know what he told me? What, Marion? He took my hand and read my palms, and he told me of my meeting you, of our marriage, problems we've had, joys. And then he said something I didn't quite understand. He said he saw your name, John. Your name, written at the end of my lifeline. My name? Yes. What do you think he meant? Your name, written at the end of my lifeline? My name? That means that... Oh, it couldn't. No, no, it, it means nothing, nothing. I, I don't know what it could mean. Someone said it meant life together, John, you and I, together until the end. Oh, yes, 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 that must be it. Here, Marion, take this pill. Now, don't think about it. Take this. It'll cure your headache. What is it, John? Oh, just an aspirin. Why? Let me have that bottle. Here, put the light on. It isn't the aspirin bottle, John. Look at it. It's poison. You were trying to give me poison. No, Marion, no. You are. You are. Oh, get away from me. You, you were trying to kill me. That's it. You are trying to kill me. You must be mad, John. Twice the night you've tried to kill me. First down at the walk, you tried to push me in the water and now... Hey, Marion, I swear to you, I didn't know. Listen to me. Listen to you. No, I'm going. Getting out of here. I've got to get away from you. Anywhere. I'll go away with Carl. He asked me to go with him, but I refused, saying I left you, wanted to be with you. Be with you? You would murder me. Don't come near me. Don't you dare. Marion, wait. Don't go. Marion. Oh, Marion. Oh, no. Was I trying to kill her? No, not Marion, my wife. The other way. I love her. Maybe it doesn't have to be her. Perhaps my name at the end of her lifeline does mean life together. My hands say death, but not her death. Death. Perhaps there is another way out. Perhaps someone else will serve to fulfill the prophecy. Perhaps. If I kill someone else, someone, anyone, then maybe I shall obtain release. Yes, yes, that is my answer. I must kill someone. Get three five. Get the taste. Three Fives by State Express. Get the taste of international success. The taste that's uniquely Three Fives. Only when no expense is spared in its making can a cigarette taste so light, so smooth, so satisfying. Three Fives. Get the taste. The taste that State Express created for you. The taste that has made Three Fives the king-size cigarette of international success. Get Three Fives. Get the taste. Poor Dr. Elliot is seated alone in his quiet office in the hospital. He has had no sleep. A thought keeps burning itself into his brain, torturing him. Can I kill someone else? Not Marion? Can I? Who will notice what I'm about to do? So much death here in the hospital. All that is needed is a simple error, a miscalculation, a mere slip of the scalpel. I'm free, released from the fate that is written here in these hands. But I am a doctor. A 
position. I have sworn. I swear by Apollo the position, and Aesculapius, and Hygia, and Panacea, and all the gods and goddesses, that according to my ability and judgment as a physician, I will keep this oath forever and this stipulation. The oath of a physician to his profession. The oath I swore to uphold. But I cannot listen. I cannot. Marion's death is written in my hand. This I swear. Into whatsoever house I enter, I will go unto them for the benefit of the sick and will abstain from every voluntary act of mischief and corruption. This I swear. Into whatsoever house I enter, I will go unto them for the benefit of the sick and will abstain from every voluntary act of mischief and corruption. This, I swear. This, I swear. Yes, yes. This is Dr. Elliot. Prepare the patient in surgery A immediately for operation. Yes. Brilliantly done, Dr. Elliot. May I congratulate you? That was the most magnificent operation. Uh, thank you, Lowell. Yes, it was a brilliant and magnificent operation. <laughs> but with that success, I know I cannot kill another person. I could not bring myself to kill the patient, try as hard as I would. Oh, I know now that I must. That it must be her, Marion, who dies at my hand. There could be no one else. There could be no other answer. I must write my name at the end of her lifeline. Accidents, emergency, death all around me. And yet hers is the death that must come at my hands. This is what must be. All in top features. Calling Dr. Peters. Please come to surgery B immediately. Accident, emergency case. Calling Dr. Peters. Calling Dr. Elliot. Calling Dr. Elliot. Please call on surgery C. Calling Dr. Elliot. Who let me alone? Not again, not another. Dr. Elliot. Calling Dr. Elliot. Surgeon in surgery C. Uh, hello, operator. Yes, sir. Uh, get me uh, surgery C. Thank you, Doctor. Hello? Dr. Elliot speaking. I can't be disturbed. I've just completed the most difficult operation. I'm frightfully tired. But this is very serious, Doctor. I don't care how serious it is. But, Doctor, it's your wife. My wife? What's happened? She was brought into the hospital just as you were leaving the operating room. She and Mr. Carl Cherney were in a terrible automobile accident. Some of them are in the emergency ward now. What was the diagnosis? Both of his severe internal injuries. Immediate surgery has been ordered. Dr. Peters has already begun operating Mr. Journey. Dr. Lowell says imperative that you operate on your wife. I, I can't. Don't you understand? My hand. My name at the end. Uh, what are you saying, Doctor? Uh, oh, all right. Prepare the patient. I will operate. I must. Um. Yes, Dr. Lowell. He said he'll be in in a moment. But doesn't he realize that this patient's status is most critical? Well, I told him what you said, Doctor. Well, where in heaven's name is he? Doesn't he know his wife is dying? Here I am, though. This patient needs instant operation, Doctor. This patient, as you call her, is my wife. I know that, Doctor. That's why I couldn't understand. I'm sorry, Doctor. Will you begin now? Yes. Oh, I will operate. No, you will stay in a Hemostat mess. Cap off the vessels now. Wait, go. Wait for the hemostat. Wait. Dr. 
I'll say it is. The bleeding is profuse. No, I say wait. I tell you what to do. Doctor Elliot, the patient's pulse is beginning to fall rapidly. Doctor Elliot, quiet. I'm in charge here. I see death at your hands, Doctor Elliot. Death at your hands. Doctor Elliot, the patient's blood pressure is taking a serious fall. At the end of my life lies your name, John. Your name. At the end of my life lies. Doctor Elliot. Doctor, hadn't you better use the ligatures? This patient will require transfusion unless their bleeding is stopped. No, no. No ligatures yet. It's all right. It's quite all right. What could it mean, John? Your name, written at the end of my life. I understand what it means, Marion. The patient's pulse is very faint, Doctor. Almost imperceptible. I see death at your hands. Death at your hands, Doctor Marion. Dr. Elliot, Dr. Elliot, what are you doing standing there staring? I can't do it. I, I can't. No, take over. I, I, I can't go on with this operation. But you must. You can't stop now, Dr. Elliot. Yes, look at me. I'm trembling all over. My, my hands are shaking. I, I can't control them. You've got to pull yourself together. It's impossible. No, I can't do it. I tell you, you've got to complete this operation. If I go on, I'll kill her. I'll, I'll kill her, do you understand? I can't even now. You've got to take over, Lowell. You've got to. Listen to me, Dr. Elliot. There's only one surgeon in the world who can successfully complete this operation. Now, that man is you. No, I can't. I, I won't touch her again. Dr. Elliot, look at me. I've seen your work before. I know what you're made of. I understand the tension that grips your throat, that tightens your fingers. Remember, Doctor, this woman is not only your wife. She's also your patient. Yes. Yes, all right. Yes, she's my patient. Remember, Doctor. A woman is bleeding to death under your hand. You and you alone can save this patient. Shall I clamp off the vessels, Dr. Elliot? The vessels. Yes, yes. Clamp off the vessels. That bleeding must be stopped. Nurse. Suit your nurse. Sponge. Cut off the anesthesia. Dr. Elliot, what is it, Lowell? May I say something? I have had the privilege of working with many great surgeons, but so that operation and your behavior in that room are the most magnificent I've ever witnessed. Thank you. I didn't know how true it was that you were the only surgeon in the world who could have pulled through that, but after that grueling operation earlier this afternoon, and the tremendous strain of hearing of your wife's accent, it's no wonder you were overwrought during the operation on your wife. It was absolutely... Let's not speak of it anymore. Do you mind, no? Oh, sorry, Dr. Elliot. Dr. Elliot? Dr. Elliot? What is it, love? It's the patient, Mr. Cherney. What about Cherney? He was crushed horribly in the accident. Dr. Peters performed the emergency operation, but uh, I'm afraid, without success, he was too far gone for man's aid. Is he dead, love? No, he's still conscious. He's got a few minutes left. He said he had to talk to you. Oh, I know it's asking a lot, but... Would you mind, Doctor? That's all right, Lowell. I'll be glad to see him. Where is he? You wanted to see me, Cherny. I haven't much time or much strength to speak. You know that I love Marion. I have always loved her. And... Last night, when I spoke to you, when I read your palm, I said I saw death at your hands. I hoped that would drive you to murder. I wanted you to kill, that Marion would be free to come to me, to be mine. But you said you saw my name at the end of Marion's lifeline. You knew I would understand that meant her death at my hands. Why? I knew you would understand. I spoke to Marion after you left, after I read your palm. I told her I loved her, asked her to come away with me. She refused. She 
she loved you, Elliot. You alone. I knew then that even if you killed and Marion were free, she would still be yours. I would never have her. I went mad, insanely jealous. I determined that if I could not have her, neither could you nor anyone else. And when I saw your name at the end of her lifeline, I told her so. I knew you must understand the meaning of those words, that you would kill her. Then you did see my name at the end of her lifeline. It is true, then, that I must kill her. Am I to have no peace until I've killed her? No, Elliot. Your name is written at the end of her lifeline. But her lifeline is very long. As long as yours. Both of you have a long life ahead of you. Together. But the death that is written in my hands. You saw it. The gypsy saw it. Death is written in my hands. You said so. Yes. Death is written in your hands. Death, the constant companion of the great surgeon. Death is with you always. Death at your elbow at every operation. Death stands by at every stroke of the surgeon's knife. You triumph, Dr. Elliot. You triumph over death. Yours are the hands of a great surgeon, a great healer, winning victory after victory over what it is your destiny to struggle against. Victory over death. She was right after all. What was written in Dr. Elliot's hand became true. His destiny was a struggle against death. The battle of all great doctors. But what about you? What about your hand? What's written there? Do you know? Perhaps you better not. <laughs> the Willow of Mukochima. Not far from Matsui, the great city of the province of the gods, there once dwelt a widow and her son. Their wooden hut looked upon the Shinji Lake set in a framework of mountain peaks. Ayame was true to the old religion, the worship of the descendants of Izanagi and Izanami. Long ere the sun rose by the chain of hills, she was up and, with Umawaki's hand clasped closely in her own, went down to the verge of the lake. First they laid their faces in the cool water, then, turning towards the east, they clapped their hands four times, and saluted the sun. Konnichisama, all hail to thee, day maker, shine and bring joy to the palace, place of the issuing of clouds. Then, having turned towards the west, mother and son blessed the holy, immemorial shrine of Kizuki. Towards the north and the south, they turned and prayed to the gods, unto each one who dwell in the blue plain of high heaven. Umewaki's father, had been dead many years, and the love of the mother was centered upon her son. He was in the open air from sunrise to nightfall, sometimes by Ayami's side, sometimes alone, watching the heron or the crane, or listening to the sweet call of the Yamabato. 
The hut was in a remote spot, but Ayame felt that her son was safe in the keeping of the good gods. It was a beautiful summer morning. Ayame and Umawaki awakened soon after dawn. Hand in hand, they went to the shore of Lake Shinji. It still slept beneath a faintly tinged haze. The Lady of Fire had not whispered of her approach to the soft mists that veiled the hills. Mother and son waited patiently. As the daymaker appeared, they cried, Konichi-sama, great goddess, shine upon thy land. Give it beauty and peace and joy. And then mother and son returned to the hut. Ayame plied her shuttle, and Umawaki left her to wander in the woods. Noon came. My boy has met some woodcutter. He talked with him in the shade of the pine trees, she thought. As the evening drew on, she said, He is with little Kime, his playmate, but I shall soon hear his soft footsteps. Night fell. Once only has he been so late, when he went to Matsue with the good Shijo. She looked through the paper window, and then stepped out. The hills cast a mysterious shadow on the surface of the lake. Still, there was no sign of Umewaki. His mother called his name. No response came save the echo of her own voice. Now she searched far and near. To every peasant she put the question, Have you seen my Umewaki? But she always received the same answer. At last she returned home, weary. He may be there waiting for me, she thought. It was midnight. The hut was empty. Ayame was heavy at heart, and as she lay upon her mat, she wept bitterly and cried to the gods to give back her son. So the night passed. In the morning, she learned that a band of robbers had been seen among the mountains. Poor Umawaki had, in truth, been stolen by the robbers. He was watched night and day, and had no chance of escape. From town to town they travelled, through strange villages where the name of Buddha was upon the lips of the people, across great plains unsheltered by mountains. The summer passed, and autumn came. Still the men would not let go of Umewaki. They treated him cruelly, and he began to pine away. Then the robbers knew that he was of no use to them. As they neared Yedo, they left him, faint and weary, on the roadside. A kind man of Mukuchima found the poor little fellow and carried him to his home. But Umewaki had not long to live. On the fifteenth day of the third month, the day sacred to the awakening of the spring, he opened his eyes and called to the good woman who tended him. Tell my dear mother that I love her and would stay with her. But the Lady of the Great Light calls me, and I must obey. Ayame had left her quiet hut by the lake of Shinji to follow the men who had stolen her son. The autumn and the winter had gone by, and still she persevered. As she passed through Mukuchima, she heard that a poor boy was dead, and soon found out that it was her son. She went to the house where he had been cared for, and the woman gave her Umawaki's message. In the evening, when all was quiet, Ayami crept to the graveside of her child. Near it, a sacred willow was planted. The slender tree moved in the wind. There was a whispered sound, the voice of Umawaki speaking softly to his mother from his place of rest. She was happy. Every evening, she came to listen to the sighing of the willow, Every evening she lay down happy to have spoken to her son. On the fifteenth day of the third month, the day of the awakening of the spring, many pilgrims visit the resting place of Umewaki. If it rains on that day, the people say Umewaki weeps. The willow is under the protection of the gods. Storm and rain can do it no harm. The Love 
of the Snow White Fox. In Izumo, the province of the gods, are many foxes. There are the wicked Ninko, in league with the Oni, that prowl about at nightfall and carry away the souls of little children. He robs the poor man of his rice and millet and bewitches the maidens who cross his path. There, too, is his enemy, the Inari fox, who is kind of heart. The Inari loves the children and warns the anxious mothers when Ninko is near. He guards the store of the peasant and comes to the aid of maidens in distress. Many centuries ago, there lived a young Inari fox. She was snow white and her eyes were keen and intelligent. She was beloved by all the good people for miles around. They were glad if, in the evening, she knocked softly with her tail against the window of their hut. When she entered, she would play with the children, eat off their humble fare, and then trot away. The god Inari protected those who were kind to her. The Ninko foxes hated her. There were hunters in the country of Izumo who thirsted for the blood of the beautiful white fox. Once or twice, she nearly lost her life at the hands of these cruel men. One summer afternoon, she was frisking about in the woods with some young fox friends. When two men caught sight of her, they were fleet of foot and had dogs by their side. Off ran the white fox. The men uttered an excited cry and gave chase. Instead of going towards the open plain, she made for the temple of Inari, Daim Yojin. There surely I will find a safe refuge from my pursuers, she thought. Now Yashima, a young prince of the noble house of Abe, was in that temple deep in meditation. The white fox, whose strength was almost spent, ran fearlessly up to him and took refuge beneath the thick folds of his robe. Yashima was moved with pity and did all in his power to soothe the poor frightened creature. He said, I will protect you, little one. You have nothing to fear. The fox looked up at him and seemed to understand. She ceased to tremble. Then the prince went to the door of the great temple. Two men hastened up to him and asked if he had seen a pure white fox. It, it must, must have, have run, run into, into the, the temple. temple. Of Inari, we would have its blood to cure the sickness of one of our family. But Yashima, faithful to his promise, answered, I have been in the temple praying to the good god, but I can tell you nothing of the fox. The men were about to leave him when, behind his robe, they spied a white, bushy tail. Fiercely, they demanded that he should stand aside. The prince firmly refused, but intent on their prey, the men attacked him, and he was obliged to draw his sword in self-defense. At this moment, Yashima's father, a brave old man, came up. He rushed upon the enemies of his son, but a deadly blow, which Yashima could not avert, struck him down. Then the young prince was overcome with wrath, and with two mighty strokes, he felled his adversaries to the ground. The loss of his beloved father filled Yashima with grief, he did not break out into loud lamentations, for the sorrow lay too near his heart. Then a sweet song fell on his ear. It came from the temple. As he re-entered the sacred building, a beautiful maiden stood before him. She turned and saw that he was in deep trouble. The prince told her of the snow white fox and the cruel hunters and the death of his father whom he loved. The maiden spoke tender words of sympathy. Her voice was so soft and sweet that the sound brought comfort to him. When Yashima learned that the maiden was true, that her heart was as pure and beautiful as her face, he loved her and asked her to be his bride. She replied very gently, I already love you. I know that you are good and brave, and I would solace you for the loss of your father. They were wed. Yashima did not forget the death of his father, but he remembered that his beautiful wife had then been given to him. For some time they lived happily together. The days passed swiftly. Yashima ruled his people wisely, and his fair princess was ever by his side. Every morning they went to the temple and thanked the good god Inari for the joy that had come to them. Now a son was born to the prince and princess. 
they gave him the name of Saime. Thereafter, the princess became sorely troubled. She sat alone for hours, and tears sprang to her eyes when Yashime asked her the cause of her sorrow. One day, she took his hand and said, Our life has been very beautiful. I have given you a son to be with you always. The god Inari now tells me that I must leave you. He will guard you as you guarded me from the hunters at the door of the great temple. I am none other than the snow white fox whose life you saved. Once more she looked into his eyes and then without a word, she was gone. Yashime and Saime lived long in the province of the gods. They were greatly beloved, but the snow white fox was seen no more. Nezumi. In the central land of Reed Plains dwelt two rats. Their home was in a lonely farmstead surrounded by rice fields. Here they lived happily for so many years that the other rats in the district, who had constantly to change their quarters, believed that their neighbors were under the special protection of Fukuruku Jin, one of their seven gods of happiness and the patron of long life. These rats had a large family of children. Every summer day, they led the little ones into the rice fields, where, under shelter of the waving stalks, the young rats learned the history and cunning of their people. When work was done, they would scamper away and play with their friends until it was time to return home. The most beautiful of these children was Nezumi, the pride of her parents' heart. She was truly a lovely little creature, with sleek silvery skin, bright intelligent eyes, tiny upstanding ears and pearly white teeth. It seemed to the fond father and mother that no one was great enough to marry their daughter, but after much pondering, they decided that the most powerful being in the whole universe should be their son-in-law. The parents discussed the weighty question with a trusted neighbor who said, If you would wed your daughter to the most powerful being in the universe, you must ask the son to marry her, for his empire knows no bounds. How they mounted through the skies, no rat can tell. The son gave them audience and listened graciously as they said, We would give you our daughter to wife. He smiled and rejoined, Your daughter is indeed beautiful, and I thank you for coming so far to offer her to me. But tell me, why have you chosen me out of all the world? The rats made answer. We would marry our Nizumi to the mightiest being, and you alone wield worldwide sway. Then the son replied, Truly my kingdom is vast, but of times, when I would illuminate the world, a cloud floats by and covers me. I cannot pierce the cloud. Therefore you must go to him if your wish is to be attained. In no way discouraged, the rats left the sun and came to a cloud as he rested after a flight through the air. The cloud received them less cordial than the sun and replied to the offer with a look of mischief in his tusky eyes. You are mistaken if you think I'm the most powerful being. It is true that I sometimes hide the sun, but I cannot withstand the force of the wind. When he begins to blow, I am driven away and torn in pieces. My strength is not equal to the power of the wind. A little saddened, the rats, intent on their daughter's future prosperity, waylaid the wind as he swept through a pine forest. He was about to awaken the plain beyond, to stir the grass and the flowers into motion. The two anxious parents made known their mission. This was the whispered reply of the wind. It is true that I have strength to drive away the clouds, but I am powerless against the wall which men build to keep me back. You must go to him if you would have the mightiest being in the world for your son-in-law. Indeed, I am not so mighty as the wall. The rats, still persistent to their quest, came to the wall and told their story. The wall answered, True, I can withstand the wind, but the rat undermines me. 
and makes holes through my very heart. To him you must go if you would wed your daughter to the most powerful being in the world. I cannot overcome the rat. And now the parent rats return to their home in the farmstead. Ned Zumi, their beautiful daughter with the silken coat and sparkling eyes, rejoiced when she heard she was to marry one of her own people, for her heart had already been given to a playfellow of the rice fields. They were married and lived for many years as king and queen of the rat world. Koma and Gong Many moons ago, a teacher of music lived not far from Kyoto. A faithful serving woman and a beautiful cat were his sole companions. Gon was a handsome fellow, with sleek coat, bushy tail, and grass green eyes that glowed in the darkness. His master loved him, and would say as the cat purred by his side in the evening, Nothing shall part us, old friend. O Umi was a happy maiden, whose home lay in the midst of the plum groves. Her chief pet was a little cat, Koma, who had very winning ways. Her mistress delighted to watch her. She blinked so prettily, she ate so daintily, she licked her rose-red nose so carefully with her tiny tongue that O Ume would catch her up and say fondly, Koma, Koma, you are a good cat. I am sure your ancestors shed tears when our Lord Buddha died. You shall never leave me. It happened that Gon and Koma met, and fell deeply in love with one another. Gon was so handsome that any of the cats in the district would gladly have been his mate, but he did not deign to notice one of them. When he saw the little maid, Koma, his heart beat quickly. The cats were in great distress, for neither the music master nor Oume would hear of parting with their pet. Gon's master would willingly have taken Koma to live with him, but Oume would not hear of this nor were Koma's entreaties more successful. It was the seventh night of the seventh moon, the night sacred to lovers in the land of great peace. When Kingen crosses the silver river of heaven, and Shakujo joyfully embraces him, Gon and Koma left their homes and fled together. It was a moon-bright night, and the cats were light of heart as they scampered through the fields of rice and across the great open plains. When day broke, they were near a palace which stood in a large park, full of stately old trees and ponds covered in full lotus blooms. When Koma said, If only we could live in that place, how glorious it would be! As she spoke, a fierce dog caught sight of the cats and bounded towards them angrily. Koma gave a cry of terror and sprang up a cherry tree. Gon did not stir and thought, Dear Koma shall see that I am a hero and would rather lose my life than run away. But the dog was powerful, and would have killed Gon. He was almost upon the brave cat, when a serving man drove him off, and carried Gon into the palace. Poor little Koma was left alone to lament her loss. The princess who lived in the palace was overjoyed when Gon was brought to her. Many days passed before he was allowed out of her sight. Then he hunted far and near for his fair lover, but all in vain. My comma is lost to me forever. <sighs> he sighed. Now the princess lived in splendor and happiness. She had but one trouble. A great snake loved her. At all hours of the day and night, the animal would creep up and try to come near her. A constant guard was kept, but still the serpent, at times, succeeding in gaining the door of her chamber, crept in. One afternoon, the princess was playing softly to herself on the koto, when the snake crept unobserved past the guards and entered her room. In a moment, Gon sprang upon its neck and bit it so furiously that the hideous creature soon lay dead. The princess heard the noise and looked around. When she saw that Gon had risked his life for her, she was deeply moved. She stroked him and whispered kind words into his ear. He was praised by the whole household and fed upon the daintiest morsels in the palace. But there was a cloud upon his happiness, the loss of Koma. On a summer day, he lay sunning himself before the door of the palace. Half asleep, he looked out upon the world and dreamed of the moonlight night when he and Koma escaped 
from their former homes. In the park, a big cat was ill-treating a little one, too fragile to take care of herself. Gon jumped up and flew to her aid. He soon drove the cruel cat away. Then he turned towards the little one to ask if she was hurt. Koma, his long-lost love, stood before him. Not the sleek, beautiful Koma of other days, for she was thin and sad, but her eyes sparkled when she saw that Gon was her deliverer. The two cats went to the princess. They told her the story of their love, their flight, their separation, and their reunion. She entered wholeheartedly into the newfound joy. On the seventeenth night of the seventh moon, Gon and Koma were married. The princess watched over them, and they were happy. Many years passed. One day, she found them caught up together. Their two faithful hearts had ceased to beat. Brilliant as always. I love these old-time radio episodes. The twist at the end are always interesting. The jealous lover. And how death wasn't for Dr. Peters himself. But the one who wards off death. Whose hands are battle-worn with victories of saving lives. Absolutely marvellous. I'm really enjoying these creaking door episodes as well. They are often darker, more mysterious, and enjoy a good twist. Also, listeners, I have another Earl Grey Patreon that is supporting the podcast. Welcome, Mace Joe, to the ranks of Earl Grey Enforcer. It's people like yourself that give me the opportunity to bring out new and interesting content. I'm really dumbstruck because this is getting me really close to using these initial funds to reach out to authors. Oh, <laughs> so excited. So thank you so much, Mace Joe, for the support. If you want to support the show with dollary dues, mates, I have a link in the episode or on SoundCloud that says support this show. A quick way to just hop on over to Patreon, and I'll keep it brief. Another way to find my Patreon is to type in www.patreon.com forward slash sfgt. And perhaps have your own palms read. Or maybe not. Have a deliciously devilish night. And till next we meet.